Welcome back. In this lecture, we are going to talk about how populations of organisms grow in an ecosystem, but we're also going to talk about why don't these populations grow as fast as we might expect them to. And so really what we're going to talk about are what's known as limiting factors. So let's begin with a thought experiment. Two mice in JSOL, Janesville School Outdoor Lab, breed and produce a litter of 10 mice. These mice breed, and each pair also produces a litter of 10, and this is going to continue for 10 generations. And it produces the graph that we see below. What we need to do first is always to label our axes. So our independent variable in this experiment is going to be the number of generations, and our dependent variable, what's going to go on the y-axis, is population size. And so we're going to call this graph population of size of mice in JSOL. Now, what you can see here is we have a very large scale bar on our y-axis. It goes from zero all the way up to 140 million mice. Uh, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to label these for you so that you can see the population growth. We start out with 2, end up with 12 after the first generation, 72 after the second generation. And by the fifth generation, we've already got 15,552 mice. Now, this is assuming no death. It's also assuming that there's no immigration, new mice coming into the population, or emigration, mice that are leaving the population. What you can see is that this growth over five generations is merely just a blip uh, when you take it in context of our y-axis here. Um, but over the next few generations, you can very quickly see that the growth is going to explode so that by the 10th generation, there are over 120 million, almost 121 million mice. Now this type of growth here is what we call exponential growth, where the population is more than going to double each uh, round of, or each generation. And so this is theoretically what we would expect for growth to be in this population if there were no limiting factors. Um, but these numbers will never be achieved, uh, and there are a number of reasons for this. And so we might start to think about what kind of factors could prevent the mouse population from becoming that large. And again, our focus here is on what we're calling limiting factors. And these are both living and non-living, or the biotic and abiotic factors, that may restrict the growth of a population. Now we can divide limiting factors into what we call density independent and density dependent factors. Density independent factors are typically abiotic and they are ones that are going to equally disrupt the population regardless of the size of the population. In other words, these particular factors here would not, the extreme or the effect that they have would not depend on the number of organisms in a population per unit area. And so there are three examples here, weather, natural disaster, and human disruption. Uh, some of those weather factors that may uh, limit growth could include things like rain, wind, and temperature. Uh, for example, if the temperature is not optimal, it may inhibit or slow the growth of a microorganism or other organisms. Sorry, they don't just have to be bacteria. We could have natural disasters, which have uh, very profound effects in a short period of time, such as hurricanes, flooding or drought, as well as fire. And then we can also have human disruptions that might limit the size of populations. For example, the creation of dams can disrupt ecosystems and additional development. For example, the development of agricultural fields, new homes or shopping centers can um, fragment ecosystems and prevent population growth. Let me provide you one specific example with dams. 
Uh, in the past hundred years or so, within the Colorado River, dams have been built, water's been diverted, and additional water barriers have been created. And this has reduced the amount of water that flows uh, in the Colorado River, but it's also changed the temperature of the water. And so what this has done is it's actually changed the population size of a fish that's found in the Colorado River known as the humpback chub. Um, the levels of this particular fish were in the 1960s were so low that they actually were um, in danger of disappearing from the river altogether. We see even some of these changes in our own environment. For example, if you're a native of Janesville, you may know that um, in the past couple of years, there's been a big argument to remove the Monterey Dam. Uh, the Monterey Dam did have a disruptive effect on the natural ecosystem of the Rock River, and the removal of it is to restore the natural habitat or natural ecosystem of the Rock River watershed. Let's now look at some of the density dependent factors, and these are things that are typically biotic. In fact, if you look at these, predation, competition, and disease, disease we can think of in terms of parasitism, these are three community interactions that we looked at in a previous lecture. In predation, predators depend on prey for energy, and so as the, the uh, size of, um, as the, the community size or the density of prey increases, we might find that the density of predators will increase as well. But with overeating from predators, uh, we might see a decrease in the prey size, which would then ultimately reduce predator size as well. We can also find competition influencing population growth. When we talk about competition, really what we're talking about here is the availability of resources, such as food and habitat. In fact, owls and hawks are two examples of organisms that have oftentimes similar prey and similar habitat, and so the two of them are in competition for resources. And finally, disease can be another density-dependent factor. Parasites, or organisms that are considered to be parasites, do require hosts, and the spread of disease will increase with density. In fact, in 2020, during the COVID-19 pandemic, part of the goal of, um, of social isolation or social distancing was to decrease the population density um, by by mandating that people would stay at home and by decreasing density in areas like schools and shopping centers, the goal was to reduce the spread of this disease. And so in this particular case here, the goal was to maintain the human population size by reducing the interactions that people had with each other. It was proposed that this would reduce the spread of the disease and therefore lead to a, a greater uh, reduction in the rate of disease in the population. Now, one factor that we do not have on here is habitat, and that is because both density independent and density dependent factors um, can influence habitat. For example, disease in trees might reduce the size of habitat for um, species like birds that might use those trees as a habitat. And also, uh, human disruption, natural disaster, and weather can also affect the habitat, regardless of whether that habitat is biotic, such as a tree, or abiotic, such as um, a, a river, or a stream, or a cave. So all of those limiting factors will have an effect on the growth rate or how quickly a population can grow. But they also have an effect on the carrying capacity and more largely the whole ecosystem actually has an effect on carrying capacity. And carrying capacity is the maximum number of species an environment can support. 
as resources are limited in a population, um, these will have an effect on the maximum number of organisms that can be pr uh, present in an ecosystem. But as a population nears a carrying capacity, those resources become more limited, creating more competition. And so if we return to our experiment from before, in which we were looking at the population size of mice and JSOL, you'll note this is a, the same graph. I've just added another 10 uh, generations onto it. And what we're going to do is we're going to set our carrying capacity to 100 million mice. What we're saying here then is that within JSOL, there can be no more than 100 million mice within the population that can be uh, stably supported by the ecosystem. And so our theoretical graph showed that within 10 generations, we would pass or surpass this carrying capacity. But in fact, what we find is the following. Over time, the population growth rate is actually going to sl slow as there becomes competition for resources. Competition is going to reduce the reproductive success and the survival of organisms. And so as we near the carrying capacity, the growth rate essentially becomes zero. And so with the presence of those limiting factors and because of limitation in resources and limitation in energy, what we find is that this population size would, would approach, maybe reach the carrying capacity, but not extend beyond it. So in conclusion, what we've talked about is population growth, and we've talked how population growth can be influenced by limiting factors. These limiting factors not only influence the rate of growth, but they also influence the carrying capacity or the maximum number of organisms that can survive uh, stably within an ecosystem.